Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to I'd begin, like to begin by, by acknowledging, acknowledging the traditional traditions of this land on which we meet today, and would also like to pay my respects to, um, to elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, welcome to another seminar brought to you by the Greek Community of Melbourne. Tonight's topic is on Lord Byron, the poet and the revolutionary in Greece, and we'd like to thank Mitra Kassavas and Co. Theo Zografos and Madula Kularas as the sponsors, and we encourage you all to become sponsors of a seminar of your choice during the course of the year. And just to remind you, if you do have any questions at the end of the presentation, simply submit them through the chat or comment section on Facebook or YouTube. We do monitor them. Let's return to tonight's topic. Think of the 1821 War of Independence and Philhellenism. The first person that comes to mind is Lord Byron. When he published Child Harold's Pilgrimage, a long narrative poem in 1812, he popularized a view of Greece not merely as a site of classical splendor, but one with a downtrodden present and a problematic future. The enormous overnight success of Child Harold meant that the views and the thoughts of Byron on Greece attracted readers across the continent. Translations of Child Harold into other European languages and its runaway success bestowed the cult of celebrity on Byron from 1812 onwards, Greece entered the consciousness of Western Europeans as a living landscape inhabited by contemporary people whose political future was beginning to be recognized as a problem to be confronted, as a problem to be addressed. In Lord Byron's final return to Greece, between the summer of 1823 and autumn 1825, which is one of the worst possible times, uh, the progress of the revolution had stalled. Missolonghi was under siege, and the Greeks of the region successfully liberated were now directing their energies towards internal conflict, resulting in civil wars that disfigured the course of the revolution. Despite this difficult period, what stands out about Byron was his dedication and consistency of purpose to serving the interests of the Greek cause. His high public profile, his tenacity of purpose, meant that he could exert influence on political judgments. He was instrumental in securing the first two loans to Greece raised by public subscription in Great Britain. His political contribution to the outcome of the revolution can be seen as the culmination of a defining quest for European romanticism that lies at the root of modernity as it, be, as, as it has come to be understood since, to transform words into things and to transform ideals into actions. And with us tonight, we have someone who needs no introduction. A dear friend, um, Professor Karalis. Professor Karalis holds the Sir Nicholas Morantos Chair in Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies at the University of Sydney. He has a wide range of research interests and is published extensively on Byzantine historiography, modern Greek political life, Greek cinema, Balkan culture, European Union, and Greece. Uh, his most recent book that came out this year, um, and we'll have some details um, on the website how to obtain it, and also with a handsome discount. Uh, his most recent book has been The Cinematic Language of Theo Angelopoulos, one of the leading figures of modernist European art cinema. And Vrasida, you owe us a talk on Theo Angelopoulos, amongst many other topics as well, in the not too distant future. Esi panda tha mas khrustas, ke mis panda tha se uh, uh, Professor Karelis, um, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, Nick, I would like to thank you and the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne uh, for the invitation to give this speech. For me, it's a very important presentation because we can't talk about the 1821, we can't talk about the revolution, we can't talk about the, if I may say, the freedom of Greece, the independence of Greece as a, a state and then as a, a sort of a, a cultural presence in Europe without referring to uh, Lord Byron. And as we will see, it is a, a sort of a kind of a, a very strange enigma, the man himself and uh, wrapped in another enigma, if I may follow Churchill in this case, and wrapped in a mystery. Who was this um, a poet who suddenly discovered this incredible place called Greece, which for him 
was a very exotic, as we will see, a place of mystery, a, a place of miraculous uh, discoveries, and at the end of miraculous admiration of its people, that actually in the end gave his own life for the freedom of that place. It is a really interesting question, and I don't think that we have the answers because we can't get into his mind. And as you will see, and that's my perception of um, of um, of uh, Lord Byron. Lord Byron is extremely contradictory and an extremely, if I may also say, extremely self-contradictory individual. What he did in one uh, decade of his life was completely different from him the other one. And actually at the end, even at the end of his life when he was in Mesologi, just before dying, actually he was thinking of other th doing other things, of going actually to help the um, revolutions in Mexico, as we know from his um, uh, from his um, uh, correspondence. But I will start with the mystery, and then I'll go to the enigma, and then go finally to the legend of of a Lord Byron, because uh, there are two Lord Byrons for my presentation today. There are many Lord Byrons, but two presentations. One who is the Englishman, the English poet of the romantic poet of that period, and then the way that the Greeks themselves saw. Um, uh, Lord Byron and what he represents and rep represented and what he represents for them to this day. So I'll start my uh, PowerPoint presentation so it will be easier for us to see through photographs and through poems because we have to understand that what is the important poet? Why did we are so important? Why did he become so popular? As Nick said, he became a celebrity it's as if and back then then is the first, if I may say, the uh, poet celebrity. He created a cult of the poet that he actually lasted throughout the 19th century. The romantic poet essentially became the heart and the conscience of the nation. He became the heart and the conscience of the arts, of the artist, artistic creativity. And then finally, for us, the Greeks, a very important part of our, if I may say, sentimental, national and finally cultural education later on when the Greek state was established. Recently, we have a, a very interesting, um, if I may say, a sort of a survey in the English speaking world, who are, which are the best poets, the poems of the, uh, of the language. And as you see, and we will read that, Byron's poem, She Walks in Beauty, is a number eight. Of course, the first one had to be always Shakespeare, but number eight is extremely important to see that Byron is there, even higher than uh, John Keats and even Dylan Thomas and Shelley and even William Blake and Milton, which I find a bit strange. But anyway, this is what happened recently. And I can start now with... Uh, um, uh, Byron, with this incredible photo, uh, painting by Vrizakis, Theodoros Vrizakis, which encapsulates the way that the Greeks saw Byron when he arrived in Mesologi, how he arrived in Mesologi in Greece, and then finally how the legend evolved after the establishment of the Greek state. What we see here in a typically romantic painting, we see the poet at the center of this composition, with all people around him as a chorus of a Greek tragedy, looking at him with uh, reverence, with love, with piety, with uh, uh, revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary sort of a fever, with uh, anticipation and erotic sort of a, um, um, anxieties, and then finally, even as we see here, that we have the religious element and. Uh, blessing from God. Don't forget that uh, Byron, of course, was a, a notorious atheist or a, mock, a person who mocked every idea of religion. And then finally, as we see the politicians here, first amongst them, uh, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, the man who was um, uh, in, in, in crucial and instrumental for uh, bringing uh, uh, um, uh, Lord Byron to Greece and uh, bringing Greece to the attention of Lord Byron as well. So this is a very interesting painting because it essentially idealizes and at the same time encapsulates the way that the uh, Byron is seen to this day by all Greeks over the last 200 years. I mean, we don't have a critical thinking, critical approach to Byron. If you see even doing a, a Seferis, observe that even the most critical, uh, and if I may say, 
you know, negative period of Greek uh, history and uh, towards England, which was the 50s, uh, uh, during the, the Cyprus uh, struggle for independence and uh, freedom, the only poet, the only personality, English personality that maintained its appeal and its, if I may say, it the grip over the Greek imagination was that of Lord Byron. For some of you who visit Athens, you will see that there's a whole area, a whole suburb of Athens, very central in the city, which is called Viron, or Byron. And uh, as we remember some of, some of them, the name Viron is a very, very popular name amongst uh, the Greeks who christen themselves without having a saint after his name, after he to sanctify the name itself. But it has become such an important institution in Greece, the name. They, the institutionalization, if I may say, the, the almost the extreme idealization of his name started already with his death. Because we'll start with his death and go back to his glory. Because essentially, as you, as you would see, this is the announcement of his death. And that's a very important aspect, what we see here, the, the provisional government of Greece under Alexandro Mavrokordato, as you will see here, did something for the first time, I would say extreme, because the, um, uh, which was unusual, should I say also very um, um, almost irreligious, because he died on the 19th of April of 1824 in Mesolonghi. Uh, he even suspended the celebrations for the Easter for that year, because which was coming three days later. And... Uh, all shops, as he says here, all offices, including the court of justice, shall be closed for three following days. All shops, except those for provisions and medicine, shall be kept shut. A general mourning shall take place for 21 days. Funeral ceremonies would be performed in all the churches. It's very interesting to see that the death of Byron eclipsed even the celebrations for the Easter. And uh, the nation forgot, as it says here, all classes without distinction of sex or age oppressed by grief entirely forgot the days of Easter. The death of this illustrious personage is certainly a most calamitous event for all Greece and will more lamentable for this city to which he was eminently partial, of which he became a citizen and of the dangers of which he was determined personally to partake when circumstances would, should require it. That's a very interesting aspect that you see of what happened in the last days of his life in Mesolonghi. And we cannot, if you go today to Mesolonghi, you see the, the park of the heroes, as they call it, there's a, the center stage of this uh, presentation is uh, Lord Byron himself, who wanted his heart, as he said, to be buried in Mesolonghi as well, and represents essentially one of the most important aspects of the, if I may say, mythologization of that period, because it was a tragic period. It was a period full of, if I may say, suffering, full of uh, sort of a kind of, uh, as we know from other uh, expressions like we have in Solomos's Free Besieged, the left people to many, a place of death and resurrection, a place of torture and hope all at the same time and all as we see from uh, later on sort of created a very a sense if i may use it which is a romantic sense a romantic term a sense of ending that something was ending the day that's that um uh, byron died however byron's death and of course, if you remember the famous painting by Delacroix about the uh, last uh, uh, um, Greece dying in the ruins of Mesolonghi, became essentially the catalyst for a big movement for the liberation of Greece. They essentially instigated and a sort of a kind, if I may say, essentially inflamed the passions for the liberation of the country in uh, the most important element that we see in that period, the new factor in politics, which was uh, the essentially the fourth estate, as we call it, essentially the media of the period. Because uh, um, uh, Byron's death became one of the first primary news in the newspapers of the period. So essentially, it galvanized the spirit to protect, uh, by, to essentially through his death, to, uh, uh, for the public opinion of Europe to essentially support the cause for which he died. In the famous 
sort of a kind of uh, a line that we see from here, the famous obituaries that we see in, um, uh, in the newspapers of the period, thus has perished in the flower of his age, the noblest of, in the noblest of causes, one of the greatest poets England ever produced. But his death was not without a controversy as well. Least, uh, just a few days before dying, and now we will discover the man and the poet as well, behind the myth and the idealized individual, Byron sent his memoirs. He was writing his memoirs in, uh, um, um, for years, for the last three years, especially when he was in Mesolonghi, sent his memoirs to his publisher in uh, um, Mary uh, in, uh, in London. It seems that the, the publisher, John Pablo and some friends read uh, the memoirs, and uh, in on the, less than a month after his death, on the 17th of May, 1824, they burned them. So they has become one of the great, as you will see, as we know, one of the enigmas and a, a sort of a kind of, uh, uh, if I may say, mysteries of uh, uh, the literary chronicle of uh, of Europe, especially of English literature, what was contained in this le in these memoirs? The memoirs today represent a very important aspect of the um, so he, of Byron's legacy, and essentially multiply the mystery around the individual. What was included in those memoirs about the great people of um, of the powerful people that is to say of Europe in that period? and about his personal, private, and sometimes sexual life. William Guilford, the native working for the Murray, considered that the whole memoirs were fit only for a brothel, as he said, and would damn Lord Byron to everlasting, if infamy, in public. Others, to this day, think that it was probably one of the worst things that happened, because essentially we had the, the authentic testimony of the individual talking about himself, and uh, through himself we could see the gradual but systematic dismantling of the pretensions of European aristocracy, the way that he himself experienced as an aristocrat. Because my point about Lord Byron and his participation in the Greek Revolution shows us a model, a way that from through which an insider becomes an outsider how he excludes himself from the establishment of power of, of that period and becomes essentially a rebel in search of a cause, a rebel in search of a reason to rebel against its own, uh, his own um, origins. After this event, I would like to mention these memoirs because the memoirs represent, as I said, one of the most important one of the most important dimensions in uh, the legacy and the memory of his work of uh, Lord Byron. This is the place that we were burned, the Murray um, office in London, and they exist to this day, and people visit simply to see the, place, the fireplace where they were burned, and they represent a sort of a kind of, as we, as we see here, one of the great enigmas of literature. Many people try to recreate them, reinvent them, that some read them and they kept notes, but we don't know anything for sure. So we cannot understand, therefore, Lord Byron, the contradictory individual, the romantic idealist in search of a cause for freedom, and the individual full of sensuality, full of sense of adventure, and then finally, as we will see, a man, as they call him, an unscrupulous immoralist, a, an amoralist, a man without ethics, without essentially any ways of controlling himself, any moral scruples of uh, controlling himself. This is how he described himself. This is a very interesting uh, sort of a kind of, uh, if I may say, aspect of his um, poetry is that that um, Byron always thinks that he is the protagonist of his poetry. His internal romantic personal I is the what gives unity to the poetic experience, what gives poetry to his poems. It is because of him that poetry becomes poetic. Wilson in Albion's eyes there dwelt a youth, 
who they pay attention to the, uh, uh, the dialectical expressions in virtuous ways did take delight, but spent his days in riot most uncouth and vexed with mirth the drowsy ear of night. Ah, me, in sooth, he was a shameless wight, so given to revel and ungodly glee. Few earthly things found favor in his sight, save concubines and carnal company, and flaunting, flaunting wiselers of high and low degree. So this is how he describes himself. Of course, this is a symbolic representation, and he likes this incredible, if I may say, antithesis between that and that, the main juxtapositions of light versus uh, uh, darkness, the concubine, the carnal company, all of them against the uh, virtues that supposedly his position as an aristocrat and his uh, experience, his social presence should have been exhibiting. This is the famous one, two of the famous paintings as we see representations of him showing how uh, sort of a kind of uh, handsome and how beautiful he was. He came really, really important. Of course, as we will see, there's some dark sides of the whole thing. Byron also was extremely bizarre in his behavior. As we will see before going to Greece, where essentially he uh, uh, founded a whole army of Suliotes to fight against the Turks, he was spending his money in other things, which is totally useless, totally, as we will see, uh, if I may say, in this case, dandies, like a dandy in that period, and totally, in that case, like a sort of a kind of, a, uh, a sort of, a, we have nothing else to do. It was a sort of a kind of waste of everything that he had, and even his own social and capital that he had uh, um, um, amassed through his poetry. As his close friend Percy B. Shelley said, when he visited, when he moved to a palazzo in Venice, Lord Byron's establishment, he said, consists of 10 horses, eight enormous dogs, three monkeys, five cats, an eagle, a crow, and a falcon, just met on the grand staircase, five peacocks, two guinea hens, and an Egyptian crane, as he said. That indicates the, if I may say, something very important that we see in him, that he was a, a man of contradictions and he didn't try to hide them. He didn't try to essentially create a sort of a kind of moral persona, a moral mask for the public and another one for himself. That he, uh, for his, um, um, and another one for his private life. That's very important because as we will see, he had to pay for that by being taught uh, totally banned from his social class in England, and then, as we will see, a permanent exile that he was unable to come to go back to his own country. I'm so changeable, he said, being everything by turns and nothing long. I'm such a strange melange of good and evil that it would be difficult to describe me. Well, in the era of social media, will understand that this is something extremely narcissistic, right? He keep, com, 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 keeps constantly about himself. This is a sort of a kind of psychopathological, almost narcissism that Byron had about himself. But who was he? And we will see that through his life that there's always a sort of a kind of an explanation behind his behavior. I don't say that I don't mean that through these biographical details we can explain the individual altogether. On the contrary, I think that it gives us a frame to see what the parameters of his uh, uh, work, of his, of his personality, how he evolved uh, mostly, and how unpredictable his life had been vis-à-vis -vis his own origins. He was born in London in 1788. His birthplace occupies a branch of John Lewis. He, was a, he had the frenetic energy inherited from his womanizing Navy father, Mad Jack, who committed suicide when he was only eight. From his mother, he had a weight problem. He was five feet, nine inches tall. At one point, he weighed over 14 stone. This very, if I may say, vexed relationship with his body can be seen throughout his writings. And essentially, as you will see, the great sort of a protagonist of his romantic poetry is always his body, 
his body, which he couldn't control. He wanted to present it as being the most beautiful, but he was not beautiful, and he knew that, so he was hiding behind, as somebody said, as one of the literary critics said, he was the man who transformed pose into poetry. He was posturing, and then he made that into poetry. Young George tried every fat diet going, from drinking glasses of sour vinegar and chewing gum made from pine sap to eating plates of only mashed potatoes and binging one day and starving the next. He was rampantly bisexual and thought men are cleverer, but women kiss better, as you understand. I'm not going to insist in his sexual escapades because they're too many and they're too lurid to describe. Bible also, Byron as well, was born with a club foot and his father died when he was only three, sorry, not eight. The club foot created a serious problem with him, always trying to cover it. When he was 10, his uncle also died and then died, and he inherited the royal title of the baron, including a state and a seat in the parliament, hence the title lord. Despite his disability, he was known for being inclined towards physical activity, including boxing against the renowned pugilist John Gentleman Jackson, and swimming, as we will see, four miles across the tumultuous uh, waters of the Hellespont, which separates Europe from Asia. He traveled extensively, across Europe, spending time with the famous romantic poet Percy Shelley and his wife Mary Shelley, when they wrote up, for example, you who have seen the movie Romantic, see Frankenstein in Switzerland, editing a newspaper that advocated independence from Austria, dedicating his wealth and life to the fight for Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire, and then finally dying an illness in Greece, which we still have him as a hero to this day. As we know, and I mentioned already, he was notorious for his sexual uh, relations. He had a, a sort of a kind of relationship, a long relationship with his half-sister, and, um, and um, had affairs with actresses, married to women's society, many young men, as I said before. Love didn't come in a triangle for Byron, but something closer to a pentacle, as they said. His level of celebrity was mind-boggling, a Byronmania akin to Regency Elvis mania, uh, where the Byronic look was mimicked everywhere in mirrors in the hope of catching the curl of the upper lip and the scowl of the brow, as they used to say. Byronmania, Vironomania, was one of the common things that we see in the poetry, literature, prose, and uh, overall, you know, style, social style of, uh, of it almost it became a subcultural style in Greece for many years. But who was Byron the poet now? Why did he become a celebrity? Why do people read his poems in such a sort of a kind, if I may say, without dedication and love? And his poems were so translated, um, as Dick said before, throughout Europe that it created essentially a, a whole romantic school that actually uh, influenced uh, po the poetry of Spain, the poetry of South America, the poetry of Russia, the poetry of Poland. We cannot really understand the, the poetry of Pushkin in Russia without reference to the poetry of uh, Lord Byron. We cannot understand the poets of Greece without uh, uh, reference to Lord Byron. We cannot understand the poets of Poland, uh, of Italy, Leopardi, for example, without him uh, in front of him. His work uh, as a translated text was extremely important for essentially reviving, galvanizing, and essentially giving the begin, creating the beginnings of national, many national literatures throughout Europe. Why? What is the important thing of his poetry? First of all, I will insist on his lyric poetry, the lyricism of his poems. And as you will see, he was always essentially and I will insist in this case, of course, in he, the influence that he had from Greece in particular. There are other aspects, as we will see, but Byron himself was very aware of that. And uh, he, at the moment, he visited Greece for the first time in 1809, and he went through the, what he describes later as child Harold pilgrimage. He wrote this incredibly beautiful, very simple 
simple lyrics, which for some of you who are interested in contemporary poetry, you will see that sometimes reappear, resurface in the poetry of Bob Dylan, of Leonard Cohen, and of Patti Smith. They are actually poems, uh, lyrics, verses to be sung. They are actually songs as we have them today. The spell is broke, the charm is flown. Thus is it with life's fitful fever. We madly smile when we should groan. Delirium is our best deceiver. Its lucid interval of thought recalls the woes of nature, nature's charter. And he that acts as wise men ought, but lives as saints have died a martyr. Here we see the best poetry of by, um, Byron. You would see he's a, a master of rhyming. He's a master of the exact word in each part of the, of the verse. And then finally, as you will see, that's why I said written in Athens, I want to use that. It sees his imaginary landscape. These poems come out of an end landscape. It's always somewhere in the East, as you will see. And of course, you will know the most important poem he wrote about that period, which later on has become one of the most important aspects of Greek poetry, the poetry of Solomos, Valauritis, Palamas, and later on even mocked by Seferis in one of his memo in his uh, diaries, The Maid of Athens, Ewe Pat, Zoim, Sasagapo. This is one of the most beautiful sort of a lyrics that he wrote about poem. This is the, the woman she, he dedicated to, Teresa Macri. And this is the um, photograph by later attended by Margaritis later on in the 1870s. Maid of Athens, ere we part, ye of give me back my heart. Or oh, since that has left my breast, keep it now and take the rest. Hear my vow before I go. Zoimu, Sasarapo. But those tresses unconfined, wooed by each keen wind, by those leads whose jetty fringe kiss thy soft cheeks' blooming tinge, by those wild eyes like the roe, Zoimu, Sasarapo. This is from Child Harold, and it's probably one of the most known, well known poems that we have to this day uh, about him and uh, uh, about his emotional connection to the land. Also, at the same time, he was an incredible sort of a kind of, uh, if I may say, kinetic, energetic language, which we lose, we use to this day, as I've said, this reminds me of Bob Dylan in some occasions. So we'll go no more a roving, so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the soul that wears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself has, have rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns to soon, yet we will go no more a roving by the light of the moon. So this is, that's why I've got the photographs here, three different aspects of, of um, uh, uh, Byron. The aristocrat, the poet, and then finally the orientalist poseur. These, some of his poems, probably as I said, would be considered to this day one of the greatest achievements of uh, English poetry, like this one, which I believe is probably one of the best poems written in the language, and I strongly recommend you to study it carefully. Today we don't study romantic poetry because we think that it overflows with sentimentality, but in reality it overflows with a sense of beauty, and we don't have uh, a sort of a kind of expectations for beauty anymore today. We don't know what beauty is about, as the romantics used to know. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellow to that tender light which heaven to godly days day denies. I'm not going to continue the poem because I strongly recommend you to read it at the same thing. And of course, the poem that sort of everybody sings for some of you who have an emotional breakdown with your uh, girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever. When we two parted in silence, in tears, have broken hearted to serve her for years, pale grew thy chicken cold, cold thy kiss, truly 
at our foretold sorrow to this. The dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow. It felt like the warning of what I feel now. The vows are all broken, and light is thy fame. I hear the names, thy name spoken, and share it, share it in its shame. So that's a very interesting, if I may say, subtext that we see in these texts. And the poems themselves are very ambiguous. The ambiguity is part of the sort of, a, if I may say, part of his the construction of his work. The work itself, as we will see, became really, really important essentially when he went to Greece. For him, suddenly Greece, the Orient, the places that he essentially discovered that is a cause beyond that one of the social critique, of social, if I may say, interaction, the social sort of a kind of squabblings between the aristo aristocr uh, aristocratic families that we see the same period Jane Austen novels and uh, the other novels of the uh, of the 20s and 80s and 30s in England suddenly he discovered that there was a world outside England he dissociated himself from this and then he actually saw in his siege of Corinth when he visited that place despite of every yoke she bears that land is glory still and theirs. It's still a watchword to the air. When man would do a deed of worth, he points to Greece and tends to tread so sanction of the tyrant's head. He looks to her, he rushes on where life is lost or freedom won. So this is what he sees always. He discovers a complete a different reality, as we will see in Greece. Greece for him becomes a sort of a kind of, if uh, sort of a kind of a way of escaping, you know, his conventions in uh, uh, in in England, Conve convention life in the English world, and especially the world, the social, the restrictive social world of uh, his of the aristocracy. That's a very important aspect, as we will see, of you know, to understand what Greece represented for him. And he something extremely important, some reason to get out of where he was. And actually, even as we as we said before, he was always something a sort of a kind of uh, a person who always sat at the margins of the pole of the uh, social uh, convention of all social conventions and social respectability. Hence the name Byronic, if we want to remember, call someone a sort of a kind of a, uh, of, uh, that someone is totally indifferent to social criticism, and all, on the contrary, has something like a Lucifer's perspective of uh, irony and cynicism at the same time, we call, them to, uh, call him to this day Byronic, because he was never restricted, or he fought against, as we will see, as we actually express, against any sort of social convention. He didn't want to be restricted. He wanted to establish his individuality, his personality, as an autonomous, independent human being. It's the great period that comes after the French Revolution, and of course, beyond the democratic ideals of revolution, after the appearance of the most charismatic individual of that period who became the model, the prototype for the, if I may say, the fortune seekers, the people who, the risk takers, the people who try to in, invent or reinvent themselves, Napoleon. Napoleon's glory and demise became the model for this generation that came after the Battle of Waterloo. And essentially, Napoleon became a great I mean, model for the generation of romantics that came after uh, the 20s, especially with Lord Byron. Lord Byron also, as I said, and I, I, we don't have much time to discuss about this, was the first one who went to Greece, right? And he actually... For the first time, he doesn't seem, simply see them as the descendants of the ancient Greeks. He sees them as they are today. He makes fun of them affectionately, sometimes with uh, invective, sometimes with his poisonous, sometimes he's really sarcastic. He goes to Hios and sees, as he says in the in the um, notes of uh, Child Harold, that he met a, a, an old lady who was lighting two candles 
one to the God and another the devil because she thought that you have, you, we have to have friends everywhere, as she said. So this is, as you see, he sees the Greeks, modern Greeks, as a sort of a kind of living human beings. He doesn't see them, uh, he didn't see them as an epitome of sort of a kind of archaeological and antiquarian perceptions of what constitutes the Greek experience of the day. He also, as you see, I like that aspect of the whole thing, throughout the whole, um, his work, especially his most uh, uh, interesting work for us, he called the Greeks Romaic. You know, they speak Romaic, they don't speak Greek. Eh? Roma, uh, uh, Romy. He, the, he uses the word Romaic, translation of the Romaic song here, uh, and uh, also to Let's make of the Romaic love as well here. And then he creates this incredible sort of a kind of, if I may say, perspective of the Greek uh, of the, of the Greek people as uh, contemporary human beings, as human beings which come out of a, the context, who live in the context. They're not simply discussing with Miltiades and Themistocles and Leon Leonidas and uh, Pericles, but they are the products of Albanian, um, uh, Ottoman, and Egyptian interaction. He sees those interactions every day. He expresses that. He translates some of the beautiful demotic Romaic songs, as he says, Beno mesto perivoli, ore ota ti haidi, I enter thy garden of roses, beloved and fair haidi, uh, who becomes one of the most important characters in his um, early uh, poetry, and uh, each morning where Flora proposes, for surely I see her in the end. Uh, this is a very interesting, if I may say, transcultural translation of a poem, of a popular poem, it suddenly becomes a lyric in the Western way of understanding things. As a chief who the combatant advances secure of this conquest before, thus with those eyes for thy lances, have pierced through my heart its core. This is, as you see, this incredible uh, sort of a kind of creativity with the Greek language. He knew, the, um, if I understand well, he knew uh, Greek, he could understand Greek very well and communicate. And also he was able to, to find the appropriate rhythms, appropriate forms to translate this work into the, the, the Greek poems into English. He made them essentially extremely popular. Some of them have been uh, put into music by great composers, and you will see how interesting is this sort of a cross-fertilization of cultural imaginaries from one language to the other through an individual like him. But we not appreciate his work without realizing that Lord Byron, with his work, as I said, he was trying to reinvent a literary, to invent a literary persona, and he wanted to create and construct a persona, a personality, an image for himself, for the poet that he he was. But Don Juan, or Don Juan, Don Juan, I don't know. There's many uh, different presentations of uh, uh, um, pronunciations of the name. Is his masterpiece. Don Juan is a, a sort of a kind of one of the uh, most interesting, rambling, unreadable, and finally, as is for some of you who try to get into their most incomprehensible, you know, poems you'll ever read. It's like a sort of a kind of someone go talks and talks and talks and talks without really saying anything. He keeps talking constantly about himself, his parents, his loves, his love affairs, his real or imaginary, and all these travels that he had around the world. But in, re in the end, what we see from that the whole thing is essentially something else, something that created essentially a whole tradition in Europe through Romanticism, that is to say something which has been uh, criticized uh, by Isaac, Sir Isaac Berlin, for example, in the roots of Romanticism, created the cult of the charismatic individual, the cult of the hero, the cult of the individual well, essentially is beyond and above all social restrictions. This is a very important aspect of this book. The book, 
as I said, it's very difficult to be read, but he has left a legacy behind. And the legacy behind that we will see here is that some of the interesting manuscripts, how he changed them, the essentially the um, uh, what he was doing, his proofreading, how he changed them, because he was fighting, if I may say, with his own material. And why was he fighting with his own material? Because he was trying to invent a new kind of literary character, which was going to dominate the whole of 19th century, the Victorian England, the American, um, uh, American tradition as well, literary tradition, and of course, the rest of Europe, the rest of Europe, we have uh, Eugene Onegin, for example, in, in, in Russia, which is a proper dominant form of, um, uh, or sort of a, a dominant uh, readaptation of this, of this character. Also, as you will see, and that's why I say that, it is a poem that invents itself as, or when the poet writes it. It is a very strange poem. As I said, you can read it only in all sort of the parts and excerpts, because it starts like this. You know, it's the first time that we see that in the ancient tradition of epic poetry, we have a fully formed heroic or unheroic or tragic characters. But he starts like a sort of a, in a strange way. I want a hero, an uncommon one when every year and month sends forth a new one, till after clawing the gazettes with cum, they age discover he is not a true one. Of such as these, I should not care to vaunt. I'll therefore take our ancient friend, Don Juan. We all have seen him in the pantomime, sent to the devil somewhat ere his time. So he actually tries to find a change who is going to be the character, the hero of his poem. It's strange, he says, but true, for truth is always strange, stranger than fiction. If it could be told, how much would novels gain by the exchange? How differently the world would men behold? How often would vice and virtue places change? The new world would be nothing to the old if some Columbus of the moral seas would show mankind the soul's antipodes. That's a very interesting, as you see, rhythm stanza, way of seeing the way that a poem unfolds its narrative. And then finally, for some of, some of you, the most literary uh, minded amongst us, you know, this represents essentially the first post-modernist poem, a poem with inserts of its own structure, a poem that unfolds the structural ability, a structural process. The poem is a process itself. It becomes a process of writing. And essentially, as you will see, some of them very interesting. It's the first time that we see in the poems itself, in the, as part of the poem, essentially Byron inviting the reader to participate. And essentially he says, you are part of this, not simply as a reader, but even better, as you see, if you buy the book as well. But for the present, gentle reader, and still gentler purchaser, the bard that I must with permission shake you by the hand and show you humble servant and goodbye. We meet again if we should understand each other, and if not, I shall not try your patience further than by this short sample to wear well if others followed by my example. So he essentially creates a poem that it seems is so important for the poem itself, for the poet, to discover who he is, how his poems, his poetry essentially unfolds. This is important literary aspect of the whole thing. For the Philhellenes and the Greeks amongst you, of course, you remember that Don Juan contains some of the most beautiful Philhellenic, you know, verses ever written in uh, uh, by a, a Englishman, a big English poet, and a European poet as well, because essentially. It, they have become some of the most important, you know, poetic sort of testimonies to the history of Greece, the historical sort of experience of Greek in, in Greece in that period. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung, eternal summer gilds them yet, 
at all except their son is set. The Sian and the Tayan muse, the heroes have the lover's loot, have found the fame your shores refuse. Their place of birth alone is mute to sounds which echo further west, even as I sing, suffuse my face. For what is left, the poet here, for Greeks a blush, for Greece a tear. So this is what he does essentially when he goes to Mesolonghi. This is the place in Mesolonghi, as you see, where he lived before he died. When he arrived in Mesolonghi in the beginning of 1824, he was sick, extremely sick by then. He found the Greeks ready to have a civil war with each other. And then he tried in all the, his, his best way to bring them together. It's interesting that he, the last poem he wrote is about discord, the honia. It's something that Solomos noticed as well in his ode to him. That essentially he tried to bring the Greeks together. He's trying to unite them against the common um, the economy enemy. And there in Mesolonghi, he wrote this beautiful poem, which is like an elegy to himself, a poem that essentially says that I had enough, this is the end of something uh, uh, beautiful, of a beautiful call that ended at a certain stage. And he wrote it on the 22nd of, uh, of January. He died, if you remember, in April, in that period. And then he says, my days are in a yellow leaf. The flowers, the fruits of love are gone. The worm, the cancer, and the grief are mine alone. The fire that on my bosom prays is lone as some volcanic isle, nor torch is kindled as its blaze, a funereal pile. So as you see, he has already thing thinking that there's something, he's only 36 um, uh, years old, and he already contemplating death. So you see the romantic poet, especially in the, in, in, through Byron, linked love and death, sensuality and death. That for him, these things, freedom and death, became part of the philosophical landscape, the poetic, the mythopoetics of the creative poet in the, of, the, of the romantic period. In some occasions, as you see, this was repeated later on by, uh, by poets like uh, Mayakovsky, by Lorca, by the, the Greek poet, I think, Yanis uh, Ritsos, who is very close to Byron in many ways. If thou regrettest thy youth, why live? The land of honorable death is here, up to the field, and give away thy breath. Seek out, lest often sought that found, a soldier's grave for thee the best, then look around and choose thy ground and take the rest. He died, as you remember, he went out uh, for a sort of a kind to uh, inspect the troops, the Suliotis, and he had a cold. His doctor was trying to actually uh, cure him by uh, sucking blood through uh, leeches of his, from his body, and then that exhausted him and soon died. The death of, um, of Byron, as I said, was a very important event. In, in the in, in the history of um, uh, of literature and society, in generally speaking, of culture in in Europe, and especially in Greece, as I said, essentially he wanted to for them. They look at him as a some, something like one of the most precious legacies of the revolution. We cannot understand, if I may say, the success of the revolution the appeal of the revolution as an event of European importance and essentially of pan-European importance and universal significance, and also as a literary landscape. We, suddenly Byron, probably to this we have to add, as I said before, Delacroix, transformed the fight for freedom, for fr the fight of a small nation in the periphery of Europe, in a symbol for the, a universal fight for liberation from convention, from tyranny, and then finally what he called, and he, I like the word that he used, despotism. The thought of having a tangible symbol of the poet was enough to inspire Greeks to fight on. This is why the Greeks fought on, and actually, as you will see, this changed completely the way that the Greeks Greek Revolution actually was perceived after 24, 1824 in the West and the, the media, ever, the newspapers, and essentially the Philhellenic, as we call it, movement 
impacted the um, political activities of uh, the rulers, the emperors, and the um, prime ministers of that period. Later on, as you'll see, and we know that very well, in uh, Vrizakis has here the uh, Greece um, uh, in expressing gratitude to the people who help here, and uh, of course, you see all of them here. Greek in Greece, Byron is not simply an individual, it's not simply a work, but essentially a work of art, that is to say, his uh, poetry. It's very interesting to see that we have stopped translating his work. His work is, as I said, extremely difficult to be followed to this day, but although I try to read the most beautiful or the most accessible poems in this case, I mean, Byron has remained a legend and a myth amongst the modern Greeks. And the myth, as you see, which is beyond every, every sort of a kind of restriction because of the contradictions in the personality itself. Solomon wrote this famous poem, or the Eastern uh, um, Lord of Verona, Λευτεριά, για πάψε λίγο να χτυπάς με το σπαθί, τώρα σήμωσε και κλάψε εις του Byron το κορμί. He thought that the body, the naked, the dead body of Byron was essentially the beginning of a reconciliation amongst the Greeks. As you read the poem, the poem is unfortunately too long to be read here. And he actually tried to find out from the ambiguities of Lord Byron, the positive, the positive, if we may say, a sort of a kind of significance of his of the personality itself. That essentially, irrespective of who you are, irrespective of how you're behaving, or where you're coming from, you can become essentially an extremely important catalyst for self-change, first of all, and then a charismatic individual that can essentially change uh, people around him. And again, he's an unusual rebel, but Byron, with his contradictions, through his personality, through his shortcomings as an individual, was able to transcend his own, if I may say, in this case, his own um, um, restrictions and create something extremely important for the European world, for the European tradition, for the European literary canon as well, which influenced Europe for the last 200 years. And if I may say, in Greece, we still revere his work. He is one of the most important individuals and the most important works of art that formed modern Greek conscience as well. For better or worse, some people say that's for the worst because essentially his language is so today parochial, so ossified, so it belongs to the past. We don't express ourselves like this. But in reality, as we see, it's something beyond that. It shows that poetry, good poetry, lives on forever and will live on forever. And as long as we understand the difficulties of the poet to express the poets, to express themselves through all the challenges they have in their different uh, and perspective periods. Byron managed to get beyond his social, if I may say, conditioning as an aristocrat and a person uh, of uh, coming from the highest classes of society as an individual with a disability. And he managed to create himself, to invent himself as, a, if I may say, one of the greatest lyrical poets of, the, of a whole century. Now, what remains from him today is another question. I think his legend is extremely important and I think we have to honor him today. That's why I wanted to honor him today with, his, with this very brief, and if I may say, in this kind of modest speech about the uh, analyzing his works. I think that the future, however, because we're going in a period when the high culture of the past and the popular culture of the present and the American in particular, in particular come together, converge, Byron's poetry and Byron's way of using irony in particular will become extremely popular again and we will have to rediscover his work in a way that I think would be very beneficial and very creative for the future of, um, lit of literature as such. On the other hand, 
and this is my last point, I think that in Greece, we still must still uh, go back to his works, study what he was trying to say with us, try to see about the Greeks themselves, try to see how he saw the Greeks. He tried to avoid any sense, any, any kind of orientalization and any kind of e exoticization. He saw the Greeks as living human beings with passions, errors, with they have a, sort of a strong uh, sense of um, uh, an individuality and then the same, at the same time a strong sense of being wrong in many, many occasions, especially in the way that they're fighting with each other. But through that, I think that Byron is one of the most important chapters for the self-awareness of the Greeks, of modern Greeks. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your patience. Um, thank you, Vrasida, for that wonderful presentation and those info, uh, insights. I think we definitely all feel uh, much closer um, to Byron's um, poetry. Uh, the floor is open to questions, and um, I might just kickstart off the, uh, the, the questions. Um, you mentioned before that um, Byron's poetry influenced a lot of other poets in, in Europe and sort of globally. What about Byron himself? Who was he influenced by? You know, was he in awe of any other poets of the past? Well, as you know, I mean, many. Some, I see a question here about the Alexander Pope. Of course, he was influenced by Alexander Pope. I mean, he, uh, Pope, Dryden, he was, if we start reading uh, his literary criticism, we will be here, you know, just for, long, for a long time. So Byron had a, an invective, invective towards his own poems, his own uh, poetic ancestors, if I say. One of them was Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope, as you know, is a great sort of a kind of uh, 18th century poet who tried to read, uh, essentially, who wrote in... Uh, uh, rhyming couplets, um, uh, um, rhyming couplets, and then he was one. Uh, the, um, but poet um, um, uh, Byron called him Dryden and Pope, the classics of our prose, as he called them, not a poet, but he called prose classical pos uh, prose writers. He was influenced by many people, I think, by many poets in this case, even Byron, uh, even sorry Goethe, the German poet Goethe, uh, and uh, of course the tradition of writing poetry in the 18th century, Edward Young and uh, uh, Dryden and Pope, where he took all this ironic and uh, sarcastic spirit, the wit, what the English call the wit, all right? He's very witty in this case, all right? You know, he, that's exactly what he borrowed from them. But on the other hand, he lives in a completely different universe. He lives in a universe of the romantic sort of extremes, of romantic extremes. Pope, always, Alexander Pope, always trying to find something which is sort of a measured, critical, should I say that, what we call classical, the classical harmony, the classical me measure of everything. But with uh, uh, Byron, everything is in the extreme. But um, um, Pope knows where to stop his poems. Byron, I don't think that he's very well aware where to put a, a, a full stop. He plays with punctuation, but in reality, he's endless, he's very, Pro, uh, pro, prolix in what he writes, and um, he has no sense of um, sort of a, if a, what we call today a form of editing, which becomes very rhetorical. But still, I think in Don Juan, which is his masterpiece, masterwork, a masterpiece as well, I mean, there are very many important things, uh, sort of a kind of uh, uh, elements which we can take to this day. And I think that, as I said, we have to study him carefully. We have stopped doing it, unfortunately. That's why I try to give you a brief anthology of his works that can be sort of a good introduction to his work, very accessible introduction to his work. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a, a question from um, Constantine Spiropoulos. How did the Greek revolutionaries respond to Byron's arrival in Greece as a poet in Philolene? Well, as, you, as I, that's why I showed that painting by Vrizakis, they were actually revered. They thought that the God, the Messiah, came down to help them, as you understand, because essentially Byron, through, the, through his poetry and through his um, celebrity status, was something like a sort of a kind of today visiting a place where refugees and people were uh, um, displaced, 
one of the most important individuals of the time, as you understand. Back then, as you see, uh, I believe that the, the Greeks knew of the importance of Byron and actually heard, of course, because some of them were could not read, but especially the politicians like Alexandros Mavrokorvatos and Coletis and others understood the political sort of, if I may say, utility, the political is sort of a use of of uh, of Byron in order to achieve the political goals of the revolution. And as you see, I mean, he created this incredible perception of Byron of uh, a sort of a kind of something unique is happening in Greece. The revolution was not simply a revolution of uh, so the Greeks against the Ottomans. It was not a revolution of Christians against the Muslims, but it was a revolution of people asking to get rid, demanding to get rid of ty uh, tyranny, of despotism. And that's very important, I think, throughout Europe and the, for the Greeks themselves, because the Greeks themselves back then, and I said that when we did the lecture on the, the beginning of the revolution, started in a sort of kind of a confusion. What are we looking for here, the revolution? What is this we are looking for? Byron, not only Byron, but other people as well, and um, gave a sort of a focus in this perspective for fight, the struggle for the Greek revolution. And I think that the Greeks in that period, the Suliotes, adored him, as you, as you, as you remember, that's why they, he created a whole um, troop of a uh, sort of a regiment with them. And of course the politicians, but mostly, as you see, the poets we can read, uh, the Elinica Chronica, the newspaper which was published by Meyer in Mesolonghi, how they represent, they present him as essentially the only hope that they had for the end of the, of the revolution, the successful end of the revolution. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, we've got two questions from Michael Vasilio, but I think you've answered the second one uh, about Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you. the first question is, do you know if there's been any work or commentaries or collections about his poems that were based on traditional Greek folk songs? No, I don't think. That's why I insisted in the presentation day, the translation, how he did them, right? It was very interesting, a sort of a kind of um, uh, how he translated them in, a, in a such innovative way. It's a very innovative translating process that he used that. And he created this sort of a, almost this sense of, um, uh, if I may say, a sort of a kind of um, idealization of Greek, um, of usually we call it today of the Mediterranean in general, because that was perhaps something that was already with the Italians, uh, and then later on established with the northern uh, Africans and uh, Africa around the Mediterranean. So I think that he created uh, this kind of uh, special approach to the Greeks, you know, the Greek folk songs. The Greek folk songs were essentially he, he, he um, in, inspired the first person, the first scholar who put them together for Yale uh, from France, to put them together a collection of Greek folk songs, which became later on the beginning of a, a collection of, po of po folk poems, uh, demotic songs, what we call demotic songs in Greek. So yes, we don't have, therefore we can, must have one. Especially, if I may say something, the notes he has in his um, Child Harold, the, uh, at the end, the footnotes are very important for how he perceived the Greeks, the, with an affectionate, almost irony. Eh? He was so affectionate that at the same time made fun of them. It was very interesting. It's a very interesting attitude because he was not the scathing. He didn't have the visceral scathing and vitriolic wit that he has against the English people who, I don't want to read some of the uh, of his uh, uh, poems here, which really, really sort of a kind of uh, almost, uh, you know, negative representations of the English mentality. That's why he didn't want to go back. Okay. Um, question here from Christos Fifus, Fifis. Apart from Maritzos, were there any other uh, Greek poets that were influenced by Byron? As I mentioned before, of course, the, the most Byronic of all of Greek poets was um, um, uh, Valauritis, Aristoteles Valauritis, but of course the most artistic of all, 
was Costis Palamas. Palamas is essentially one that comes out of Byron, and uh, he tries to work with the Byronic irony sometimes, and sometimes he has to work with the Byronic lyricism as well in his best poems. Ritsus is very influenced by him, especially his early period, I think, but there are many other poets, modern poets in particular, I think that who know of his work, for example, some of the poets you would say, even, even Katerina Ho, who uh, essentially who is, has this essentially explosion of poetry, uh, of uh, a sort of a kind of romanticism against the established, romantic explosion against the establishment, but many other tools like Pulios, like Lagios, um, and, and even like uh, Angelaki Rook. Uh, that many, uh, the Byron is, is, appears here and there discreetly, I would say, because um, as you see today, Byron's poetry is considered, as I said, a bit, you know, just parochial. You can't find, I mean, these emotions are emotions for singing. They are songs. They're not poetry. They're considered poetry. But the greatest poets, modern Greek poetry, found a way of communicating uh, with, the, with uh, Lord Byron. Don't forget, uh, since Chris Fifth has asked that, don't forget that one of the most important regiments of the communist army was called Lord of, Vi uh, Lord of uh, Byron, eh? and who were fighting against the, the Germans and later on during the Civil War. Lord of Byron, Lochos Elas Epon. Eh? So, Lord of Byron was always the symbol for uh, um, resistance, for f struggle, for essentially, if I may say sometimes, of a struggle without a hope of victory, which is really interesting, <laughs> a hope of victory, which is really interesting in this case. Anyway, yeah. Well, that, that, that's a good way to finish that question because um, it leads to the next question by Vasily Samis. If Byron lived to see independence, would he have remained as part of the Greek establishment, or was he always a rebel fighting an idealistic cause, and Greek rep and Greece represented the ultimate cause yet? Well, <laughs> I think he was always a rebel. That's why I said he was planning to go to um, uh, Mexico, where there was another revolution happening in that period as well. I think that B Byron stood, first of all, that he couldn't fit into the uh, into the restrictions of his social class. I mean, today we don't pay much attention to the aristocracy because we think of aristocracy as being a sort of a kind of something for in front of the cameras, as we see with the royals of the English family, uh, the English royal family, the ro uh, ruling family of, of of England. But back then, being an aristocrat meant strict protocols of behavior, strict uh, following of sort of a kind of savoir vivre, of how to behave in public. So he was not that kind of person. And I think soon he would have, of course, he has an idealistic thing, and for him, um, the end of the revolution in Greece would mean the beginning of the revolution in another place. He would continue, he's the eternal rebel, the, the rebel that tries to find new ways of keeping his rebellious spirit alive. That's why in... Some of his poems, like Cain, like uh, um, um, he represents himself as many people saw him as a Lucifer, as Lucifer himself, all right? And uh, that's a very interesting aspect of him as a the diabolic spirit, uh, diabolical spirit of rebellion, constant rebellion, unhindered and unimpeded by any uh, fear or restraint. Okay, I've got a question here that's been texted to me by Jeff um, Conahan. Were 18th century, I think he means 19th century Greeks, aware of Byron's scandalous reputation in Britain? He was called mad, bad, and dangerous to know by Lady Caroline Lamb. He was a scandal in London and a legend in Greece. Can you comment on that? Yeah, that, that's the, <laughs> essentially, that's the contradiction, as I said. No, I don't think that the, uh, the uh, the Greeks were very well aware of. They have heard some things about his uh, scandalous sexual escapades. Don't forget that he, in Greece, he was, um, um, if I may say, in, I don't know if he was in love or in lust for a, 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 a young boy as well, right? You know, just you know, if you watch the film 
by Nikos Kunviros called uh, Byron a ballad for a demon. And it gives you the, <laughs> the exact um, way that we see him, uh, we, they saw him back then, no, so the Kunviros saw him as a desperado. No, the Greeks didn't know of all his um, sexual lives, uh, you know, just sexual uh, labors up in, in England, but they knew that there was something unique about him as a, um, if I may say, a very actively, a very sexually active individual. They knew that because they have uh, essentially experienced, experienced that themselves. But on the other hand, as you see, in Greece, we don't have the Greeks of the 19th century. They have never demonized sexual desire. And uh, behaving sexually, even with promiscuity, was not a very important aspect of, you know, just a stigma in your social life, unless it became, re you were married and you have children and you created a conflict within your families. So uh, I don't think that the Greeks knew very well what was happening, what happened in England, but they show immense interest for him when he was in Greece itself. You know, he became a sort of a very important, if I may say, sort of a kind of symbol of Englishness okay. as well. And um, um, don't forget that the word uh, uh, my lord, in, uh, because of him, has become milordos in Greek. We use the word milordos in Greek when it says that someone is really important because of him as well. So, no, they didn't know much about him, but they were ready to accept him, especially after he, um, in uh, during the revolution, he came down as a revolution and not as a lover, although in him there was a lover as well. As well, for some of, you know, we have to rea realize that the, a poet has a living body, is a living body as well. He has desires, especially in that period, especially an individual like him, who was totally a sort of a kind of, if I may say, he was rebelling, he was a revolutionary. He didn't want to be restrained by his class, by his, the morality of his class, by the, um, uh, the, the virtue ethics of that period. Uh, uh, but the, the Greeks still love him. And you, whenever you tell them about the scandals, that he had in in, uh, in, uh, in England, or the scandals he had in Greece, as a matter of fact. And they think that, uh, well, good on him, bravo. You know, <laughs> he enjoyed his life. That's that's the important thing. I don't think that there's uh, any way of moralizing amongst the Greeks, in any way, moralization about the Greeks, about his, his um, uh, sexual behavior. Okay, just a quick question for Manj uh, Ginos. Lord Byron was a prominent uh, philolene, why has no Hellenic government ever made him posthumously a citizen of Greece? Why have they? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a very important question. I think he's a citizen of Mesolonghi, which automatically made him a citizen of uh, of Greece, as we understand. But, I mean, the recognition is extremely important, as you understand there, as you see, uh, because we have an area, a suburb called Vironas in Greece. And as I said, it's very interesting to see that we have a name given Vironas eh, without having a saint. You cannot be baptized a, a name in the church without a name being after a saint. So it's a great, essentially, uh, if I may say, dispensation made by the Orthodox Church to give a pagan, heathen, and uh, infamous name as the name uh, Christian consecrated through the mystery of baptism. And I think that it, de facto, the Greek state has recognized him, uh, uh, but um, the jure, if you say legally, I think we can sign a petition to send to the Greek state to do that. Yeah. Um, another follow-up question by Christos Fifis. Um, did Solomos and Byron ever meet? Did Solomos read Byron? No, no, they never met. They never met, although... As you as we, because Solomon, when Byron came to Greece, Solomon was in Italy and then came back and then he went to Zakynthos and then there's a war and this and, and Solomon, as you see, he was very young back then. He was only 20, 23 years old and um, uh, he was in uh, Zakynthos. Now they never met, although Solomon was uh, Solomon was very well aware of of his work uh, of uh, of Byron's works, especially in, in uh, through Italian translations. As he had. But he, the poem he dedicated to his death indicates um, the impact, the influence that he himself had as an individual and as a work.
on him as a, as a poet. And we must understand that indirectly, through Solomon, Byron becomes essentially one of the pillars, right? the beginning, the, if I may say, the inaugurators of Greek literary tradition. Uh, Sol Solomos is influenced by him. Of course, later on, he goes beyond the Byronic uh, framework, and he, he discovers German metaphysics and German uh, philosophy, and he adds something which Byron didn't have, a transcendental depth to his vision of beauty, of uh, freedom. Uh, and uh, But no, they didn't know each other, not even Calvus didn't know. Actually, uh, Christo, if you remember, Calvus didn't know Solomos, although they lived in the same city. They never met. They lived in the same city, which was how many people back then lived in there, and they never met, which shows, uh, says a lot about the, the mentality of poets, as you see. Okay, I've got a, a question from Mike as a Ferropolis. Is there a publication that describes major non-Greek contributions to the revolution, such as Byron? I suppose maybe a publication on, on Philhellenes, which is... Oh, yeah, there are many publications. Actually, there's a famous book by Roderick Beaton, the last one about Byron and the Greek Revolution, which I strongly recommend to see because it's very detailed and shows what happened with Byron. But in the past, we have Dawkins, Greek, British Philhellenes, uh, in the Greek Revolution, and many other books about the American uh, American Philhellenes, the Polish, the other people. There's Philhellenism was a, 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 a field of studies that's been... Uh, to this day, explored and investigated in from many different uh, perceptions, uh, different perspectives, because it is uh, it was a pan-European event. The Greek Revolution, as we heard last week, was a pan-European event. It was connected, interlocked uh, to the other movements that were happening in Europe in that moment, and actually it accelerated the push for change and the demise of the empires in that period. And so uh, there's a lot of things about um, uh, the Philhellenes. For some of you who are interested in the Byron case, although there is a lot of information about that, find the book by Roderick Beaton, Lord Byron and the Greek Revolution, which I find it really informative and in, in, enlightening for the on this topic. Okay, and uh, we might just finish with one more question, because I think the final question has probably been answered from Petra. Uh, was Byron a spy for the British Empire? I don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, Byron could not have never been a spy because he could never keep any secrets, as you understand. He probably <laughs> would have, what he would have done, he would have made it into a poem, and then that's it. The whole world would have read about it. You know, just people after Byron were famous or infamous spies, and uh, probably very interesting to discuss about them later on. But um, I don't want to spoil the reverential atmosphere towards Byron with uh, the other, um, um, uh, you know, just the, if I may say, spies that the British Empire had sent to the to Greece. But Byron definitely he was not, because he essentially understood himself, if I may say, as against the British Empire. He made fun of the British Empire. He essentially uh, understood, you remember, I didn't have the time to read, probably we have to do that, some, in some other occasions, the verses he wrote against Lord Elgin and the uh, plundering of the Parthenon. He thinks that essentially, it's not simply Lord Elgin, Elgin, it was essentially the British Empire, the imperial system, the imperialist system that made them possible and legitimized them. So essentially Byron could not have been a spy because he was against the imperial and imperialist policies of um, of Britain. Some of his poems, we don't have the time to discuss them here, The Vision of Judgment, it's a scathing, scathing satire of the British monarchy as well, right? You know, makes, you know, just he thinks of them as a load, load of, you know, just excrement uh, and this kind of thing. So I don't think that he was so much, but other people later on, yes, they were, but not him, I believe, unless in a few years, we'll discover some documents will tell us this. That, that will be very interesting. interesting. Okay. I, I think we might bring proceedings to a close. Um, yeah. Thank you uh, very much once again. And I encourage you all to have a look at Brasidas' new book on Thea and Jalopoulos. And um, don't forget uh, next week's seminar with Joy DeMussi and um, Sheila Fitzpatrick. Hope to see you next week again. 
Thank you, Vrasida. That's a panda kala. And um, hopefully our next meeting will be in the flesh in Melbourne at the Greek Centre. Let's hope so. No more Zooming. No more, you know, the mediated communication. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss the work of uh, Lord Byron and his contribution to the Greek Revolution.